most of what I'll be speaking about this morning, or I'm going to say three things, it's going to be belief, faith, and hypocrisy. And, and those three things kind of sound like they don't go together, so I'm going to do my best to break it down for us. Our real big idea, our main topic that Pastor Curtis has been teaching about in this series is faith. And I've really enjoyed it. It's challenged me in some ways. So our main idea is to have faith in God. And that sounds pretty simple, but sometimes we seem to struggle with applying this in our day-to-day lives. What's it look like? So the last few weeks, Pastor Curtis has been teaching about faith, how we get our measure of faith, where faith comes from, all these important things, many other things. So I was going to talk just a little bit about mine or how I believe my walk started. So when I was about 18, or when I was 18, I joined the military. And that's also the season of my life where my faith really began to be exercised. Or maybe I could say it better. I could say where I really tried to, or where I began to try to understand my faith. So it was the first time I actually read the Bible cover to cover. I don't like admitting that, but it was my first time. I was in a really tender place at that time, and I wasn't sure what to believe. So some people that I trusted were actually different religions than I was, that I am. And so I began to ask questions about my belief altogether. I really wondered who was right. I asked myself, are the Muslims right? Maybe the Mormons? Gosh, maybe even the atheists, are they right? So I had a lot of questions, and I really needed some answers. My faith and belief were very challenged during this time of my life. So last week, Pastor Curtis mentioned how faith rests on belief. And I need to tell you all that I really had been struggling with this message right up until he said that. The moment he mentioned that faith rests on belief, I got really excited. The the Lord showed me where to go with this message right then. That's really pushing the time frame for me, just so you all know. I really like to have a message down two to three weeks prior to me speaking. So anyway, I was getting uncomfortable. So some things I accept that Pastor Curtis has been teaching, I accept that my measure of faith is from the Lord. I appreciate that. I accept that I just can't, I can't just create more faith myself. So the question to me is, what can I do? What's my part? My first thought was that I need to steward well what the Lord has given me. And I believe that's very true. Whatever we're talking about, whatever the Lord has given us, we need to steward it well. But when Pastor Curtis mentioned that faith rests on belief, I was excited because that's exactly what has shown true in my personal life, in my life experience. And it's nice when we can see, when we can understand how our personal experiences fall into history, into his story, into history, right? We need to see how our life fits into God's plan, the meta narrative. It really landed for me when he spoke that, and I hope it did for y'all as well. And I'm going to try to break that part down just a little more. See, that young version of me, that 18 to 19-year-old young man, wasn't sure what to believe. But I went to the source. I went to the truth. I got in the Word. I happened to have a really good man around me, a chaplain, that that he was very willing to answer my really hard questions. He spent a lot of time with me. I appreciated it. I truly began to believe that Jesus was a real man that walked the face of the earth. Now, that that may sound easy for y'all, but it was not easy for me at first. I had to do a lot of historical research, but I began to believe. I began to believe that Jesus lived, Jesus died, was buried, resurrected, and ascended. And you may wonder why I say that. And it's because once I believed, I began to see my faith exercised. I began to see my faith in use. That led me to begin to be able to see through my faith how the rest of the Bible was true. Now, did y'all catch what I'm saying there? There was parts of the word that were hard for me to believe, hard for me to grasp. My faith rested on my belief until my belief rested on my faith. I began to see that we have a spiritual battle. Now, today I understand that the spiritual battle is the real battle. So, I began to truly believe and live in my faith. You know what happened next? I went on to live a perfect life and never messed up or doubted again. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I hope nobody believed that, right? What, What really happened next was that I realized I'm a terrible hypocrite. I didn't like who I saw in the mirror, right? I had faith and belief, but I was a hypocrite. It was really hard for me to stomach. It was hard for me to grasp. 
As a young adult, I was a hypocrite often, very, very often. I'm sorry to say that. Connection Church has a lot of young adults attending right now. I have a few words just for y'all this morning. Really, they're for everybody, but I hope y'all can uh, really latch on to these. You can learn through wisdom, or you can learn through consequences. I chose consequences too often. Choose to learn through wisdom. Make sure you really let this sink in. You can learn through wisdom, or you can learn through consequences. You get to make choices, but you don't get to choose the consequences of your poor choices. I want our RISE ministry, our young adults, to know I'm proud of y'all. I'm glad you're here. We're all proud of y'all. We're so thankful to have you. I'm looking forward to what God is going to do through y'all and through this congregation as we disciple y'all. So, that said, we still have young adults to adopt. I'm excited about this, y'all. This is your chance, congregation, to make a big difference. We find ourselves in a world that we don't always like, right? We may even go so far as to blame that next generation. Now, to me, that sounds a little hypocritical. If we aren't willing to disciple that next generation, then we need to stop blaming them and point to ourselves. So who among us will teach this next generation? All right, I want to create just a little more tension in us this morning. I have a question for all of us. This one's tough. Are you a hypocrite? Ask yourself, am I a hypocrite? That can be hard to ask. It can be hard to answer. So we got to really dig in. What does it mean if we are hypocrites? What are we going to do about it? I kept praying and asking the Lord which story about my hypocrisy I should share The truth is, it was overwhelming. I had lots of stories to choose from. (laughs) That part wasn't exciting, I'm sorry to say. So last Wednesday morning, I get up, I'm praying, and the Lord finally makes it clear to me. And I'm just going to tell you all my story. When I was in seventh grade, I switched schools. I'd been at Austin Junior High, and I switched to Sam Houston. And, And yes, it was called Junior High back then. I still, I was fresh. I was new to Sam Houston, so I still knew more people at Austin. Just so happened that those two teams, those two basketball teams were playing against each other. So I was staying with a friend of mine from Austin. He was the athletic trainer for the basketball team. So I'm staying with him. So I go to watch the basketball game with him. During this game, I noticed that he had a new really cool watch. For those that remember, these were called Swatch Watches. (laughs) This one was clear and it was super cool, super, super cool. So he kept fidgeting with the watch. He'd take it off, put it back on, take it off, put it back on. He's messing with the watch. And so I finally asked him, why are, you, why are you messing with your watch? Why you keep taking it off and on? And he says, we're not allowed to wear them during the game. And I remember thinking, you're a trainer. What's that matter? But anyway, I looked down. There is a little pile of watches down there from the guys who are playing basketball. So I'm like, okay. So anyway, we get back to his house later, and he offers to let me borrow the watch. I'm excited. I take it. I put it on. I'm, I wear it for about three days. So I'm back at school wearing the watch at Sam Houston when three or four guys that I know, I know them well today. I didn't know them well at that moment, but they come up. One of the guys says, Hey man, that's a nice watch. Can I see it? I say, yeah, I'm excited. Take it off, hand it to him. Well, he puts it on. And when he puts it on, he just turns to walk away. So I'm like, Hmm. So we had a little scuffle. There's like, (laughs) I I didn't use my words well. Right. (laughs) So now I don't, I don't win this scuffle. There's three or four of them and me. So we're, we scuffle around. It finally stops. And um, I say, hey, that's my buddy's watch, you know, somewhere in there. And he corrects me. He says, no, it's my buddy's watch. And I'm like, what? And so we have a little more back and forth. And he just looks, one of the, the guy that put the watch on looks right at me and says, there's no way that you didn't know that watch was stolen. And he turns and walks away. And so I'm still mad. I'm still upset. So I didn't win the scuffle, so I go tell the principal, right? So I go tell the principal, and I explain to him what's going on. And oddly to me, nothing comes of it. Not right then, at least. So I get, I get home from school. I start calling my buddy that loaned me the watch, and I don't get a hold of him for about another three days. I can't get him on the phone. Finally, I get his mom, and his mom puts him on the phone. And he doesn't admit to me that he's lying, but I knew he was. So now I'm starting to figure out what's going on. So fast forward just a few short weeks, I'm at another buddy's house from Austin. 
and my bike is busted. My bike doesn't work, and it's a long way from my house. His mom couldn't get me home. My mom couldn't come get me. So I ask him, hey, can I borrow your bike? Yeah. So I take his bike. I get home. I call him on the phone. Hey, man, can I ride your bike to school tomorrow? He says, yes. So I get my bike chain, put it on his bike, ride to school there at Sam Houston, lock it up, go to school, come out from school that day, and the bike is stolen. It's gone. This bicycle's gone. So what do I do? I go in and tell the principal. Right when I tell the principal, he looks at me and asks me, is this the same as the watch? I feel about this tall all of a sudden, y'all. I'm like, oh my gosh. So maybe you hear this story and you think, hey, I'm not a hypocrite. Joshua's not a hypocrite in that. And in some ways I'd agree. But I know the Lord gave me, <laughs> yeah, in the wrong ways, right? So I know the Lord gave me this story and I'm going to explain why. This one really does. And just so you know, I think I could preach for a year straight and tell a different story about me being a hypocrite. So I have no problem with hypocritical stories, unfortunately. So I'm sharing this one because it comes clear to me as I age and reflect that I really was lying to myself about that watch. There's really no way that I should have believed that that watch belonged to my buddy. I'd never seen him with it. I saw him fitted in with the thing. I knew better. I really did know better. I believe today that I was willing to overlook it because he let me borrow the watch. I think I got involved there in a way I shouldn't have. And there were clearly consequences once I had to report the bicycle stolen, right? I wonder what that principal really thought of me. And just so y'all know, the bicycle, the principal does go to work on it. And about a week later, he actually busts the kid that stole the bike. So my buddy got his bike back and it even had a few upgrades. So <laughs> that, part, that part worked out. So hypocrisy, I'm talking about hypocrisy. What does that look like? Well, for me, here's a real clear cut case. I'm sitting talking to a man. I'm in a room with a, a good group of men. And this really good man shared with us about how he had wronged someone in his past. And in my head, I thought, man, why would anybody ever listen to this guy? Right after having those thoughts, the Lord convicted me, though, and reminded me that I have had some very serious sins to overcome. And now I stand in front of y'all today trying to teach about faith, belief, and, and hypocrisy. And in some ways, it feels like I should just stop. But the truth is, we can all learn together. So what's the truth about hypocrisy? I, I want to go straight to the source for, to start. So y'all, please stand with me as we read Scripture this morning. Mark 11, 11 through 14. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. You may be seated. Now, Right after this moment is when Jesus enters the temple. He drives out those that are buying and selling in the temple. He overturns tables of the money changers. He makes sure that they understand that his house is a house of prayer and not a robber's den. Now, there's a lot going on here that would be really fun to unpack, but i got to stay on target. I'm just going to sum this part up by saying that Jesus wasn't going to allow their hypocrisy to stand without opposition. And now this brings us back to the fig tree. Mark eleven nineteen 19 tells us that they left the city that evening. Now Mark eleven twenty 20 through 22 says, As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Now, as I read through this pericope, this, this portion of Scripture, I, I'm left with two big questions. The first question is, why would Jesus wither that fig tree? Is this just the first recorded example of someone being hangry? Right? <laughs> Jesus hungry and bad? I don't know. No. In, in verse 13, Scripture says it was not yet the season for figs. So my first question really is, why did Jesus wither that tree? He, he sees the tree with leaves, he goes to it, it's not the season for figs, yet he withers it anyway. The second question I have comes from verse 22. Jesus says, have faith in God. So it's the next day, they pass by the fig tree, Peter sees the tree, and he says, the tree is withered. 
The answer Jesus gives actually catches me off guard. He just says, have faith in God. Well, we get it. We should have faith in God. But really, what does that have to do with this fig tree? So I want to break this down. I want to unpack it just a little. We have a hard time understanding this scripture because we don't live there. We don't see fig trees throughout the year. We have a hard time understanding why Jesus would curse that tree. The way we read it is that it wasn't even possible for the tree to have figs yet. So I want to just explain this part a little. The Judean fig tree is barren in the winter, but in late March, the tree begins to produce leaves with a pre-season fruit known as page. These early unripe figs are edible, and they are even sold in Jerusalem's markets today. They eat them today. Jesus sees leaves on the tree from afar, which means the tree should have page, the pre-season figs that are edible. He went, to the, he went to eat the early figs, but he found that tree to be barren. Here's where we get a biblical glimpse of how to define hypocrisy. That fig tree was hypocritical. The tree was a hypocrite because it had leaves but no fruit. Once the mature fig tree has leaves, it will also have prefigs. It will have page. That's how they work. The prefigs are there once there's leaves. So think of it this way for us. Maybe it was all dressed up for Sunday church, and it even used nice language. From afar, it looked very promising. Upon inspection, though, there was no fruit to be found. That tree looked like it had promise, but it had no performance. Its actions didn't match its appearance. Or for us, we could just say that the actions didn't match the words. So now we get to the second question. That response from Jesus that, to me, initially feels out of place. Peter pointed out that the fig tree was withered, and Jesus simply says, have faith in God. So the question is, what does faith have to do with the withering of of a fig tree? What does it have to do with hypocrisy? Think this through with me because I think it's pretty neat. Think of all that the disciples had already seen happen through Jesus. They'd seen all kinds of neat things. Now, men that attend Bravehearts on Tuesday mornings just heard Bill teaching, and he was talking some about Peter and all that Peter had done through Jesus, all that he had seen. He saw so many miracles, and he even had enough faith to step out of that boat and walk on water. Now, I like how Bill explained this. He said that Peter walked on water, but he also sank, right? He was good when he was focused on Jesus, but when he focused on his life, when he focused on his circumstances, he began to sink. It was good, Bill. I stole it. It was good. It was real good. Now, the disciples knew that Jesus could do miracles, right? They know this. Why? Because they had firsthand experience. They saw it. They had seen demons being cast out, the blind receive sight, and the lame walk. They had even seen a dead person brought back to life. They didn't question those things because they witnessed them. They didn't have a faith issue when it came to believing in miracles through Jesus. So having faith in this context is not their philosophical consent that Jesus could do miracles, but is rather acting in accordance with God's will. This shows us, I hope y'all are as excited as I am about this. This shows us our connection between belief and faith. For example, Jesus was just in the temple flipping tables, right? Now, those temple leaders are out to kill Jesus. Yet, they're hypocrites who, like that fig tree, had signs, outward signs of religious fruit. They're dressed in these priestly garments, but in reality, they have no fruit. They're hypocrites. Those temple leaders out to kill Jesus and his followers would wither like that doomed fig tree. Have faith in God. God's adversaries will be removed because the Lord is victorious. God wins. I hope we catch that. Jesus tells them to have faith in God. In this context, having faith in God is acting in accordance with God's truth. We're not, we're not redefining faith here. I'm just showing the connection between belief and faith, how they go hand in hand. So faith, Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So real soon, these apostles are going to be faced with a difficult situation. They would need to have faith in things unseen. They would see Jesus crucified and buried. And their faith was shaken. We know what happens. They actually scatter. 
right? They run. But it doesn't end there. Jesus is resurrected. Now they see and believe, and their faith is restored. They didn't somehow change their measure of faith, but they certainly learned how to better exercise their faith. They see the resurrected Christ, and they are suddenly willing to die for their faith. Following Jesus was and is life-altering for us. Now, think of those disciples. They saw all that Jesus did, but when he was crucified, they were scared. They did scatter. We know how Peter reacted. He even denied Jesus. Yet, once the disciples see the risen Christ, their faith and their belief collided to a point that they're willing to die for Jesus, for their beliefs, for their faith. So, how do we apply this to our lives? Well, Mark, in Mark chapter 11, we find some points to apply. So I'm going to keep working through the same scripture with just three main points so we can see how to apply this. Mark 11, 11 through 12, we learn, see the need, right? Jesus had a need. He was hungry. Verse 12 says he was hungry. So what am I saying? Pay attention to needs, yours and the needs of others. Sometimes when we're in need, we're, we're finally willing to be humble. And sometimes others are finally willing to listen. Right. Number two is see the potential. Verse 13 says there were leaves on that tree. If there are leaves, there should be page, the edible prefig. Pay attention. Look for it. Number three is examine the fruit. In verse 13, line 13. In verse 13, Jesus walks over and inspects the fruit of that tree. We often hear, don't judge, right? But that can be misunderstood. We really are supposed to be fruit inspectors. Just be sure to take the log out of your eye, right? Now, in verse 14, Jesus condemned the tree because it was hypocritical. Having leaves but no prefigs meant two things in this case. One, there was no prefig to eat. He was hungry. And two, there would be no figs at all. Why, why, why am I willing to say that? Because they would have already bloomed with the leaves. That's what the prefig is. This mature fig tree was going to remain fruitless. I'm going to break down verse 14 just a little more with three quick examples. But this is just three of many, many examples that we could make. Number one, that tree had an empty profession of faith. Some people profess Christ, but sometimes their profession is empty. Their lives don't match what they profess. They lack life. They lack good behavior, good works, purity, honesty, faith, love, and on and on. There's no distinction between them and the world. Number two, that tree had an unfulfilled purpose. Some people profess Christ, but they, don't, but they only continue in their own worldly pursuits. They forget God's purpose entirely. Many who profess Christ spend their time, energy, and money only to pursue their own desires and ambitions instead of God's will and purpose. In Matthew 7, 20 through 23, Jesus speaks to this and makes it very clear how important this is. He says, So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That one scares me, y'all. Number three, the tree deceived instead of serving. Some people profess to serve, and perhaps they do serve a little. They have a little service, but their commitment is still truly to self. Service to God is only in addition to serving themselves. God is not their Lord. This person may have no intention of serving the Lord. He looks upon God as merely being there for his salvation. God must be our Lord and our Savior. I think at times we leave this discussion purely at salvation. And salvation is the beginning. It's vital. I cannot be any more saved than I already am today. So we need to discuss what comes next. And I want to try to make an example that I hope will land for y'all. When I married my wife, when I married Amber, I thought I knew her. Right? <laughs> But I have spent the last 18 years learning more and more about her every single day. I'm no more married today 
than I was when the preacher said, I now pronounce you husband and wife, right? But 18 years later, our relationship is much more complete. I don't mess up nearly as often because I know how to love her. But I also know I get to learn more about her tomorrow. It's not the end. I think that's similar in our relationship to Jesus. He saved me. I can take no credit for that. But now I want to learn more more about him so I can love him more, so I can be more like him. There's nothing I can do to make Jesus love me more or to be more saved, but I can learn more about who he is to be more like him, to live in my faith. Loving him means obeying and serving him and many other things. So, some practical application. I'm going to go to Scripture here. I'm going to speak about a different fig tree that's in Scripture. It's in Luke 13, 6 through 9. Jesus says, A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and didn't find any. And he said to that vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. So in this example, Jesus gives this fig tree a chance. The first tree, that that hypocritical tree, that tree was mature. Jesus withered that tree. It got pruned. In this second example, the tree still had opportunity to change. It was only three years old, not yet a mature fig tree. It was close. They mature at three to four years. To help it change, Jesus says to give it some fertilizer. If you need to change, you need some new fertilizer. So so what's our fertilizer? Well, I'm going to make some examples here of how we get good fertilizer. This isn't an exhaustive list. Now, I think one of the most important things I could say this morning is to listen for the Holy Spirit. Listen. So I just wanted to start there. But I'm going to run through a list, and I'm going to run through this pretty quick. So if you have questions about it, grab me sometime. Let's talk. Y'all will know what I'm doing here. Number one, be in the Word daily. Get to know God. Read His Word. Have a good prayer life. Speak to God. Number three is personal retreat. Take planned time to spend with our Lord. Spend time with Him. Number four is worship. Now, worship is a broad category that we sometimes misunderstand. Our entire life should be worship to God. But in this case, I specifically mean set time aside, worship the Lord. Number five, be in community and be in church with other Christians. Number six is serve others in the church and outside the church. Number seven is vital. Be in discipling relationships. Relationships are how we grow. And number eight, keep his commandments. This is action. Take action. If we love Jesus, we're going to do what he says. Now, those are spiritual disciplines, and they're very important. They are of utmost importance. Those are biblical fertilizer. It's what matters. I'm going to share three more examples, though, of how we can apply these truths, or maybe better said, how we can work on not being hypocrites. Now, these come out of a book that Pastor Curtis has all of us on staff reading. The book is called Didn't See It Coming by Kerry Newhoff. Number one, take responsibility. There's a simple reason we blame circumstances and other people rather than own up to our own faults and failures. It's easier, right? It's easier than dealing with ourselves. Now, blame is the opposite of responsibility, Every time you blame others, invent justifications, or craft a fresh excuse, you evade responsibility. Number two, progress begins with self-honesty. As soon as you start to admit that you are the problem, you start to make progress. You can blame your team, your board, your spouse, your kids, the economy, your profession, or even gravity. (laughs) But none of it is going to reshape your character right? And number three, make your talk match your walk, right? Research shows that the average person hears as many as 200 lies a day. That's amazing. And 60% of people lie during a typical 10-minute conversation. An average two or three lies during that short time frame. This has made me think, y'all, right? So, I was trying to think what's something I do. So this one may be pointed at me more than y'all. Stop lying to your friends. 
right? Maybe you use what we call little white lies. Like when you say something like, uh, I can't make it to that event because I'm busy. When really, all we want to do is just to rest in the Lord, right? Be honest. It's good for all of us, right? But maybe, most of all, we need to stop lying to ourselves. For example, when I was that seventh grade boy, I was lying to myself about that watch. Or, I'll say it this way, of all the lies we tell, the lies we tell ourselves are the deadliest. One of the best things we can do to overcome our hypocrisy is to humble our talk and accelerate our walk. Humble your talk and accelerate your walk. You know what happens when you are relentlessly committed to making sure your talk matches your walk? Well, you change your walk. Every time we line up our public talk to match our private walk, it makes our private walk better. We, words actually have that kind of power. If they're honest, if the words are truthful, right? So as we start to conclude this morning, I want us to take just a minute to, to really examine ourselves before the Lord. I would like for us to just pause and ponder on these statements as I ask these questions. If you'd like, you can even close your eyes. Just consider these things with me. Number one, is Jesus really the first priority in your life? Or is his will, his worship, and his work just an afterthought for you? Number two, do you have all the outward appearances of being a Christian, but no real commitment to God? Number three, do you shout in praise, testify, prophesy, and pretend to worship while you hold things in your heart against others? Number four, do you look and act saved at church but live like the devil everywhere else? And number five, do you plan your life around all the things that you want to do, but don't see the need to plan around the Lord's work? Number six, do you gossip, but you label it in a way that sounds like ministry? And number seven, what do you need to trim from your life to produce good fruit? So fruit is the evidence. What are some biblical examples of good fruit? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. And Galatians 5.19-26, through 26, you all know this one. This is where we go. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Another, a branch can't bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, unless it's attached to the vine. What's the vine? Well, Jesus is the vine. We know this. That comes from John 15, 1 through 11. We, if, when we are all leaf and no fruit, we're living in spiritual hypocrisy. We want to become congruent. Hypocrisy and congruence oppose each other. We want to be the same no matter where we are. Now, this doesn't mean we want to be the same jerk no matter where we are. Right. This means we want to travel the path of sanctification and be the person that God intends for us to be, no matter where we are. We don't want leaves only. Because of our love for Christ, we want to have fruit. What you see at church should match what you see at home, at work, and when you have to deal with a customer care rep that works for the company that keeps overbilling you. 
Maybe that last one's personal. Right? <laughs> now, I don't steal today, but I did steal in my youth. If I tell you today, don't steal, am I a hypocrite? The truth is, I have to get past myself and speak God's word. In some way, all of us have been hypocritical. That doesn't mean we shouldn't teach others not to fail where we have. Often our own testimony comes from the experiences where we have messed up. We overcome because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We should all point to Christ. When we mess up, we can repent, we can confess. When I speak with someone that is repented and is confessing, I often find myself repenting with them. Often the very thing they confess is something that I need to repent of as well. This is good for all of us. Thankfully, God extends grace to us, His beautiful grace. We're going to make mistakes, but God loves us through them. If He loves us through our sins, through our hypocrisy, we should have faith in Him and love ourselves as well. Let's not abuse this grace, though. Today, I'm going to end. I'm going to conclude with this scripture. Romans 6, 14 through 18. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We are righteous in Christ. Please stand as our altar team comes forward. Lord God, this morning, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for every family represented here. Lord, I thank you for the Adame family and for our lives merging in these ways. Lord, this morning, we want to lift up all our youth as they're out skiing, Pastor Curtis, Pastor Matt, everybody that's out there, all our adults that took their time to take these kids and let them enjoy this wonderful weekend. Lord, we'd also like to live up, uh, raise up. We have 12 ladies out on the walk to Emmaus, 10 that are attending and a couple working that are on the team. Lord, we just ask that uh, they really grow in your love out there this weekend. Lord, I'm sure they're excited to get back. I'm sure everyone here is missing them, but we're so thankful they get to be there. Lord, this morning, most of all, we ask for you to help us to understand our faith, how we can better serve you and better become like you, Lord. Please show us how belief and faith work hand in hand, and please, Lord, allow us to grow out of our hypocrisy. Lord God, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.